Oh my god. It burns. Oh, what is happening? Oh. Huh? My, my shadow. Blue Dragon is one of my favorite games of all time, just purely out of nostalgia. It is the game that made JRPGs my favorite genre. Now I've played some other traditional turn-based RPGs in my youth, such as Dragon Quest VIII or Final Fantasy VII. But this is the one that made me go, hold on, Nippon is cooking with these. I mean, this game shared the same creative team as Chrono Trigger with heavy hitters such as Hironobu Sakaguchi, Nobuo Uematsu, and Akira Toriyama. I don't think it's crazy to say that this game did for me what Chrono Trigger did for present day 40 year old RPG fans. Love you guys. I literally, literally, I literally wrote the whole plot into a notebook in third grade and my teacher found it after I got done and probably thought I was a special little boy. It was a formative game for me. There's also two anime that may or may not have aged well. Uh, I do remember liking the first one quite a bit. Uh, I liked it so much that I had these light scribe discs and I burnt every episode onto different discs. And then I flipped it around in the light scribe burner. And I burnt a little graphic onto it. And then I even like created menus. So when you put it in the DVD player, you had like play episodes and like a little background graphic. I really have a lot of childhood nostalgia for this series. So much so that I have quite a bit of memorabilia for it. Uh, I have the Game Informer magazine where I first kind of seen anything about the game at all. I have the official strategy guide, the American copy of the game, and I also have a Japanese copy. So the only way to play the game in Japanese with English subtitles is by getting the Australian copy of the game for some reason. Really strange, but I'm looking for it, but it's very hyper specific and I, I haven't had much luck. Now, I'm not a fan of Microsoft, to be honest, but I really think it's kind of cool how they dubbed this game into so many different languages. There are seven. That's kind of insane, because at most you're lucky if you get two. It's just infuriating to me that the North American copy got the German dub over the Japanese dub because I am a filthy weeaboo. Yo! Oh yeah, and I also own some trading cards. I don't know if, uh, I don't know if I showed these already, but in case I didn't, Future me, put in the trading cards, because I think they're cool. Soundtrack's not as good as Lost Odyssey's, which is Blue Dragon's older brother, but it holds a more dear place in inside inside here to me. I also think the graphics for this the graphics. I also think the graphics for this game have aged incredibly well just because of the timeless Akira Toriyama art style. Hell, even Dragon Quest VIII on the PS2 looks great just because of how styled it is. Oh yeah, and Sakaguchi kinda did his part too. He opened his company, Mistwalker, in 2003 after departing Square Enix. Blue Dragon was his first project and he decided to do what helped him rise to the top in the first place, and that is copy Dragon Quest. And I'm not trying to shame Sakaguchi by saying this, I actually prefer Final Fantasy over Dragon Quest. I even got my Uniqlo Final Fantasy shirt on right now, as a matter of fact. And also, Mr. Walker created two of my favorite games of all time in Blue Dragon and Lost Odyssey. I just think it's really funny that he left and founded his own company and then copy Dragon Quest again, but this time with the Dragon Quest lead designer, Akira Toriyama. Who made this little fucking guy, mind you? And this game just feels so much like Dragon Quest. I mean, it's kind of what drew me to it in the first place. I loved Dragon Quest as a kid, and I also loved Dragon Ball Z. It's where the name of this channel came from. So when I seen this little fucking Goku on the cover, you know I was hooked. Remember about two minutes ago when I was given Microsoft props for dubbing the game in seven different languages? Well, this is because Blue Dragon was their attempt at conquering the Japanese market. They were really hoping this was going to be a hit game for them, and they bought exclusivity rights to it. Historically, Xbox just hasn't done well in Japan. I mean, just look at Phil Spencer. Bro really thought he was part of the team. But the game did sell well enough for being locked on a console that was destined to not do so well in Japan. It moved 30,000 Xboxes through its console bundle, and it sold about 80,000 copies in its first week. I'm sure after this, Microsoft was feeling good about their future in Nippon, but knowing what we know now, they're still not really doing so hot over there. Now, I hear you saying, Double well, Sunday, if this is your favorite game ever and you already beat it, why are you doing backlog babble about it? I thought this was for your backlog games. Now that is an astute observation of you, dear viewer. You are very smart. However, despite all my nostalgia and all the memorabilia and all the feelings I feel towards this game, I haven't completed it start to finish. I know, I'm making a big fuss about it. 
but as a child me and my dad would play games together and one day while I was at school he just decided to finish it and I never I'd never got the satisfaction of doing it I have seen the endings on YouTube and I have played the game at certain points in my life but I never made it all the way to the end you don't like my ponytail oh, okay thanks there are a lot of games unfortunately that fall into this category in my backlog and this is the first of many honestly now let's start getting into the don't say meat and potatoes 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 basil blue dragon throws you into the story of talta village there is a violet cloud that comes every so often and following it is an ancient machine in the form of a land shark the villagers are up on a platform watching their entire life be destroyed this you know the usual but then the resident blacksmith, Fushira, can't find his grandson, the protagonist Shu. He asks around and somebody notices Shu on the ground trying to fight the land shark with a cosplay buster sword. Turns out Shu and his friends Jiro and Kluke have had enough and want to make a stand. They trap the land shark in some netting but it breaks out. The three grab onto a rope from the net and get dragged down into the ancient ruins. Now, dear viewer, let me tell you about this song. This stupid little silly song. It has been my favorite video game song since I was a child. It's just so nostalgic and scratches all the right areas in my brain. I'm gonna let you listen to it for a minute. It's not like a banger or anything, but it's my favorite, okay? After waking up, Shu gives the land shark a good kick and notices it's an ancient machine. He wakes up Kluke and Jiro, and Jiro utters one of the most awkwardly delivered lines of dialogue, and it has stuck with me. We made the net from metals we found here. That's correct. The three then try to find their way out of the ruins. They fight a monster that looks like if Akira Toriyama had amnesia, but he idolized Akira Toriyama and he tried to replicate his style. A poo snake. After they clear them out, the land shark reactivates and flies into the sky. It takes them into a flying fortress. An arm comes up and throws them into a tube. At the end of this tube, the three meet the person responsible for their village being ravaged, Nene and his annoying little parakeet fetus thing. <laughs> the children, the children, the children! <laughs> That's enough! I really just want to fucking... He tells the party that the only reason he destroys the village is to hear their screams like he's fucking Randall from Monsters Inc. sucking the screams out of people for energy. Yeah, needless to say, this game didn't win any awards for writing. That's correct! He summons this big purple dragon and you three try to fight it with your bare hands like it's your average run-of-the-mill poo snake. He beats your ass and then Sabo tosses you out of another hole. This is Shu's first instance of uttering his famous catchphrase, I won't give up. I won't give up! And apparently this saves everybody. What's going on? I know why. It's because I said I won't give up. Now they're back in the ship and they're presented three spheres to swallow. <gasps> Swallow the spheres. They need to swallow these spheres in order to fly this mega thing. Once they do, their shadows morph out of the ground into a minotaur, a phoenix, and the titular blue dragon. They then fly away in the mecha, and then crash it. Then Shu says his catchphrase again for no reason. Kluke is hurt from the crash and Jiro heals her. This is where the three come to terms with their new magical powers. And that's pretty much the groundwork for the game. Now it opens up a little. The party is headed for Talta Village, but first you have to traverse through the desert. This is the overworld where you're just a little guy and you traverse location to location. This is also probably a good spot to mention the thousands of explorable areas full of... Nothing. Item. This creates so much more exploration that is either a nightmare or amazing depending on the person. I for one really like this aspect of the game. There are no random encounters, thank god. All of the monsters are also just little guys and run around on the map. The job mechanic is a real highlight here. The shadow classes are modular. Any character can be any class at any time with any combination of other skills. It's really nice to have this much control over your party and it gives you a sense of freedom over how you play the game. Anyways, after wandering the desert you wind up at the sheep tribe camp. A bunch of nothing happens here until you run into a sheep tribe's man Dampa. He's cornered by this big dinosaur and this is where you first hear the boss theme. Yeah, that's Ian Gilligan, the lead singer of Deep Purple, Mr. Smoke on the Water, 
This was such a crazy collab to me back in the day. Uematsu and Ian Gilligan came together and made possibly the worst boss theme in history. Truly amazing. This was said to be because the lyrics were given to him in Japanese and they were poorly translated so they, it just winded up becoming complete gibberish. Anyway, after this the party sees a huge drill. They go inside and they find the most annoying character in the game, Marumaro. You guys start fighting and they notice he has a shadow as well. Maro brings up Nene and mentions that he also hates him. The drill makes it into an underground hospital and Maro darts out. The party follows him and sees him getting his ass beat by this ice fire wolf. No matter how badly you don't want to save him, you kinda have to. Are you okay? He once again tells you how much he hates Nene and why he's here in the first place. He needs to find medicine to save his village. They decide to help him because I guess your village isn't in the process of being destroyed? Once the medicine is found, you four go back to Maro's village and see all the sick villagers. Maro gives them the medicine and, get this, it makes things worse. Only one person could have come up with this. It was Nene and his parakeet fetus. Nene caused the sickness at the village and made Maro get this medicine because he needed it. He drinks it, but it doesn't do anything, so he kinda just attempted mass genocide for no reason. After regrouping, Kluke says her dead doctor parents have treated this disease before. She draws the plant that they use to cure it from perfect memory, but then when asked where the plant is, she goes, well, what do you expect? I mean, I was just a little girl back then. <laughs> Thankfully, the village elder is not useless and knows where the flower is, so you guys head there. On the way there, the party has to go through a cave. Nothing fucking happens here, so let's walk over to the forest of the dead. You find the flower and bring it back and it cures everyone. Maro's dad gets a little bit too excited about this. Hey! <laughs> Honey, I feel like we could have another child or two! I feel so energized! Now that everyone is cured, you can go back to talk the village and see if everyone is dead or not. Oh wait, they might be as abandoned. Shu finds a note from his grandfather that says they went to Gibral Castle to find refuge. The party decides to go to Gibral, but on the way they hit Mural Town. This is where some backstory about the world is dropped. The planet used to be ruled by a king with very powerful magic. The people who had magic waged war on those who didn't. The king didn't like this, so he built machines to aid those who couldn't use magic. This created the Eternal Engine. However, people as a collective are stupid and the two sides winded up wiping each other out. Now this sounds kind of important, right? Nope. Now on the road to Gibral, you finally catch up with the villagers. This sequence includes a heartfelt moment where Jiro's parents said that they thought he was buried alive and they dug for him until their hands were raw. Also, the suicidal bitches love my mustache guys here. The group gets surrounded and things begin to look hopeless until Shu says the magic words, I won't give up. I won't give up! That summons the entire Gibral army. A lady breasts Boobly over. She can also use a shadow. She introduces herself as Zola, and Maro falls in love with her and is annoying about it for the rest of the game. What is wrong with you, Maru Maru? The gang finally makes it to Gibral. I like Gibral. I like the aesthetic. Like the theme, pretty good city. The party talks to the king and finds out Nene attacked Gibral Castle. Zola tells you guys you're going to strike back. Jiro asks how, and she goes, I don't know. She invites you back to her quarters, and then flashes back to how she got her shadow. The party tells her how they got theirs and recall a certain voice. Zola, do you have anything to say about this voice? <laughs> Swallow the spears. Someone else. Huh. Hmm. You go back to the inn and rest, but in the middle of the night, the violet clouds come. Fushira gives you 10 phoenix talents, so you know shit's about to get real. You guys board the mothership to destroy the eternal engine. You fight Sabo and his goons. The engine gets disabled and the battle is won. Everyone but Zola chases after Nene and the mech hit in this cool little minigame, but he gets away. But the battle is won, so you go back to the castle to party. And that wraps up the first of three discs. Now maybe it's just because I've played the beginning so many times, but I really don't like disc one. After a pretty strong intro, just three-fourths of the game is just running around doing nothing, and then you get to Gibral. There's very little that moves the story forward, and the things that do happen feel like filler and I didn't really like them. I didn't like the Devi tribe, I didn't like the poison forest, I didn't like the cave where nothing happens. It just feels like a lot of padding. I think learning more lore about the ancients here would have been better suited because, spoiler alert, you don't really learn much more about them other than what happens in Mural Town. Instead of just making me go through some big, long, uninspired cave, make it do something with the ancients, you know, have like some lore in there, or have like some artifacts, or some history, just anything other than that. 
It's, it sucked. Another major gripe I have is that the game is told through the eyes of children. Now, maybe when I was a child this affected me in a different way, but unfortunately I'm 26 now and it just doesn't do it for me. There are huge life-altering events happening and they're tragic, and instead of delving into the themes of loss and hope, you just have some kid saying, I won't give up, and that's the only character with any sort of resolve in this game. There's so much loss happening at the hands of Nene. Kluke's parents are dead, Talta Village is displaced, there was a plague, and the bastion of hope in all of this is just a kid saying, I won't give up. And it's working for everybody, and I kind of hate that. It is the most passion anybody has in this game except for Nene and his genocidal rampage. Here's an example of an emotional moment handled poorly. The entire fate of the Devi tribe is resting on a flower Kluke saw when she was a child. Jiro was trying to console her, and that's sweet. But this moment just turns into, oh no, I hope she likes me and not Chu. That would make me sad. There are so many huge moments happening and I just don't think the party has the emotional maturity to handle them. And I think that's why we should have more 40 year old men like Ichiban Kasuka be protagonists of RPGs. I say this only half jokingly because he is the perfect example of a lens that the plot should move under. He understands the gravity of situations and the implications behind it. He's charming, he's funny, I love him, Like a Dragon 7 is the greatest game of all time and... What were we talking about? Oh yeah, I think more adults should be protagonists of RPGs, or at least be used to convey the gravity of some situations. The only time I felt any sort of emotional connection to anything that was going on is when Jiro's parents dug for him until his hands were raw and shared that story with him. That's some heavy shit, imagining them just digging and digging and digging and their hands are all just beat up because their son, the only thing they have left, is buried alive, they think. That's the only time anybody has shown any believable reaction to anything that's been happening. And I hate Maromaro. Anyways, disc 2 starts and King Jabral wants Nene fucking dead. King Jabral is sending Zola north to stop Nene from activating ancient machines. The party offers the help and the king agrees. You head back to the inn. You, he you head back to the inn while the king and Zola have a moment where he gives Zola a ring and tries not to make it awkward. She puts it on her ring finger and this freaks the king out. Shu and Jiro see this and decide to make a ring for Kluke. This stresses Jiro out because he has a crush on Kluke and Shu wants to do it just because he saw the king do it. This is actually a crazy good mini game, and I really wish more games did this. You pick crystals in order to make the best ring you can make. You want the most magic attack since Kluke is a resident black mage. You get to equip it and it actually raises your stats. Really cool, really liked it. The owner makes the rings and they go on their way. And Kluke goes, I like both rings. And that's that. You guys then head out on your quest. Your blue dragon quest. <laughs> you head south to the exile forest and see one of the first side stories in the game. I'm just gonna sum this one up real quick. Okay, see you around. That's it. That was just a side quest, so now you go east of Jabral to head to a laser field. The fucking moons are shooting lasers at you and you have to dodge them. A robot calls you into the hatch and you go. Shu tackles and punches one of the chillest dudes in the game for no reason. He welcomes you into his town and explains that they're the servants of humans from ancient times. They've been waiting for a master for over 10,000 years. You try to move forward but there's a blue barrier blocking your way. And this dude's been trapped in there for 10,000 years. The robots know where the device is to remove the blue barrier. Huh? They tell Shu and the gang where to find it. Now this is a long sequence where basically the party gets the blue barrier device to get out of the town. They pass through a factory that has been non-stop making robots since the ancient war ended. One of the robots drops a barrier device and you guys pick it up. You guys emerge from the factory and the earth fucking splits in two and a million robots come out to get your ass. The robots have a TV on their head and Nene is on it ordering them to... Squash! However, Jiro gets the barrier device that the robot dropped to work, holding them off. Nene halts the robots. 
Then he says that he also plans on world domination, which is even more cliche than wanting to hear people screams. It then cuts back to the robot town and it turns out that Nene is our master. He then commands them to throw themselves into the barrier and they start fucking exploding in an attempt to get the party to lower the barrier. Zola says to keep the shield up and the party goes, What the hell are you talking about you crazy bitch? Bring this barrier down right this instant. The robots collapse and a chill robot says that any ancient can act as their master. The party blacks out and this dickhead robot gives you food that's just out of arm's reach because he's a cunt. But the cool robot lets you out because he's chill. You go and release Jiro, Amaro, and Zola, but where is Kluke? Nene is carrying her away. Chu follows him and he summons a bunch of robots you have to fight. The robots fuse together to make a Giga robot, and Nene goes inside of it with Kluke. Then you do a mini game where you have to dodge small robots while chasing the big one. After punching it in the Achilles, the robot stops and heals itself. Then it jumps over a huge crack in the ground, and that ends the chase. Nene is left with Kluke. After a short trip north, you wind up in Patches Town. Patches Town is engulfed in a green barrier. You can get in no problem, but you can't get out. One of the villagers say only good magic can break the barrier, so the party tries to break it but to no avail. But they sure do scare the shit out of everybody. Now everybody hates them because the magic reminds them of Nene, the reason why they're trapped in here in the first place. You head to the village elder to clear up some misconceptions and the elder goes to tell everybody you're actually pretty chill. Nighttime falls and Shu and Jiro have a moment. Jiro confesses his feelings for Kluke in front of Shu and asks if he likes Kluke too. Shu says he thinks she's special and doesn't really answer Jiro's question. The back of the elder's house starts glowing and you four go investigate. You find an ancient machine in the elder's room and flip a switch, then you hear a door open. You see the elder in front of a bunch of broken machines. In this room is also a painting that depicts the final days. This painting looks like Nene's fetus. This beast genocided all of the ancients. Maro touches something and the moon fucking shoots a laser at the town. The party has an idea to use the moon lasers to get rid of the barrier. However, the machine is missing a piece because Nene did a little trolling and dropped the piece in a hole. You get the piece, go back up, shoot the lasers, and the town is free. Yippee! Now to save Kluke. The elder used a moon laser to destroy a big rock and make a path across the ravine where the robot took Kluke. You find a giant robot in a sinkhole. You guys start sinking in the sinkhole, but don't worry, Shu says the magic words and everything is okay. Nene comes out of the robot holding Kluke. She has a collar around her neck. He throws her down and Jiro tries to catch her with wind magic, but he uses too much force and throws her into the air. And then she just fucking dies. Just kidding. Shu goes to catch her and the party is reunited. Kluke is saved. Minus the fucking collar that's gonna explode in one hour. It will explode! Nene tells you to go up to him and get the detonator before the bomb explodes. You progress through the robot and guess who the fuck it is in a boss fight? The land shark. You beat its ass and then you have to fight Sabo and his minions again. You win and Nene kills Sabo for losing. You go to the third floor and do a minigame where you control the moon and try to shoot the other moons. You go to the fourth floor and fight a bunch of robots that fuse into a bigger robot. Then you go into the fifth floor and you have to fight the chill robot, but you don't want to kill him because he's chill. You have to destroy the Dyson vacuum that's controlling him. Sabo comes in to fight again and Zola fights him herself. The rest of the party go to confront Nene. Nene activates the necklace and her collar affects everybody and now they're all captured. Nene again reveals his true plans where he was using the party as vessels to grow his power. He tells the little fetus he's happy they're friends and then robs the party of their power by eating their light spheres. Oh no, he's hot! He stomps on Shu and fucking kills him. And then the game is over. Just kidding. He stomps on Shu but he has some residual power left that helps him fight the robot. He grows a shadow back and gains a flea option after not having one for the entire game because he won't give up. He uses his power to teleport everybody away, and Nene is in disarray that Shu still has his shadow. This is where Disc 2 ends. Disc 2 is a definite improvement over Disc 1. It's actually moving the plot forward in meaningful ways, and it just feels more focused overall. It doesn't feel like there's as much padding as Disc 1. Uh, Alamaru Village is definitely some side content, but it's not really, it's not mandatory really, so it doesn't matter to me. The combat opens up, you have more of your toolkit, battles are more fun. There's some interesting segments such as Patches Town being engulfed in the Green Barrier, or Kluke's Collar Countdown was pretty interesting. I still don't think the story is that engaging, but I do like traditional turn-based RPG combat and it's doing it pretty top-notch here. Overall, Disc 2 is a bit better than Disc 1. Disc 3 opens up with the party passed out in a big hole. A robot stomps on a party member's and Nene taunts Shu. He shows them the ruins of the world outside of a window. But then Shu wakes up and realizes it was a dream. 
He goes downstairs and talks to an old lady, and she reveals that he was asleep for three days. She tells you you are in Devour Village and your friends are in the plaza. Shu asks where Zola is and nobody knows. Shu explains how everybody got away and how Nene stole their power. The light spheres were actually part of Nene's soul and the party wears vessels to grow his power. Shu explained that he could still use magic and everyone went, whoa. Shu admitted he finally gave up in a weird attempt at some character development. You guys go to leave until you see somebody being crushed by this weird tree that's in the village. He was trying to chop it down. It is then revealed that the tree keeps the villagers trapped here and it eats them. The party comes to the consensus that it's pretty screwed up, so Nene probably did it. Shu tries to square up with the tree in an attempt to summon a shadow. He gets his ass beat and wakes up in the old lady's house again. Kluk has collapsed in the inn and she has a very high fever. Shu said the rings him and Jiro made aren't helping and he tries to take one off. But then Jiro said when she was captured by Nene, the rings helped her get through it. Aww. You leave the inn and go to a cliff. There's a girl about to commit suicide in an actual pretty heavy scene. And Shu saves her. But remember how I said one of the game's shortcomings is that it's told through the eyes of children? He then goes on to tell her he's just simply built different and would never commit suicide. You then mash A to prove you're stronger than the girl who was about to kill herself. You then fight a clone of your shadow. This is where the limit break mechanic gets introduced, and honestly, it's pretty sick. The clone merges back into you and Shu's magic is officially back. It freaks out the girl. Shu goes back to tell the rest of the gang and heals Kluke. Maro tried to summon his shadow, but he just hits himself. Shu then goes back to fight the tree. You limit break on him and fucking murder him. Before you leave the village, the girl gives you some cookies she baked for you. They shake hands and she runs off. You guys are now in a forest. You guys leave the forest where nothing happens and wind up in Nolta Village. Everyone is frozen in icicles by, you guessed it, Nene. Kluk sees a girl whose parents died and a light shines in her heart. Jiro understands what it means to be a family guy and a light shines in his heart. Maro talks to some frozen kids and a light shines in his heart. Jiro states the obvious and everyone's shadows awaken. The three shadow box and regain their magic. You get to see all their limit breaks which are admittedly pretty cool. Now that your magic is back you can warp and go back to Jabral Castle. You tell the king what's going on at the village. He tells you to go to the basement where information is being gathered on the machine that has frozen everybody. The head researcher tells you a password for the machine. You go back to the village and put it in. The machine turns into a robot and you fight it. Once you defeat him he drops a device and this device can get rid of white barriers. After this you wind up in a desert and there's a mecha flying overhead that is carrying Zola. She gives you the rundown on what happened. She tells you that ancients preferred the magic as the light within oneself and that explains the mystery as to why they can summon their shadows again. There can be no shadow without light. You guys now have a mecha you can fly around the overworld with. Now here you can either go to the game's final area or do some side content. But I just went to the game's final area because I'm fucking crazy like that. You go on the one way trip and journey into the sinkhole. There's a giant earthquake and a violet cloud engulfs the world. The party sees the earth split and a bunch of cubes fly out of the center. Nene is huge and he explains that this is how the world was in ancient times and how it should be. On your way to the center of the earth, you get chased by a land shark. You shoot a ton of missiles at it and wind up in the center of the earth with a bunch of cubes. You now enter a cube called the Primitive Cube. A dinosaur shows up and you kick its ass. The dinosaur's eye projects an image of Nene and he tells you he's going to make you his retainers. He then gets even more delusional and says he'll make one of you his successor. You end up in this big lava dungeon where you need symbols to open the doors. This lava dungeon fucking sucks. I, d I did not like this part of the game at all. I hated it. So I'm just going to gloss over it. At some point, you fight Sabo and his minions, but this time they're all fused together. Nene orders them to get the fragments of a soul that remain in the party. It's a crazy long fight, but it's pretty straightforward. After the fight, Zola personally slashes down Sabo and gets them to take you to Nene. Nene yeets Sabo for absolutely no reason and explains that the party is useful in a final attempt to recruit you. He throws a galactic donut at Shu and tries to steal his power. Doesn't work. You guys then finally fight. You get through his first phase, and then he becomes Giga Giga Nene and grows muscles from his huge cube. He heals your HP and MP at the start of the battle. That's nice of him. You beat him and his big cube falls apart, he falls down and his little fetus scurries away. He calls out to Zola and then he reveals that Zola was his servant all along. Who could have seen that coming? Swallow the spears. Now you're fighting Zola and she doesn't really attack. 
Nene sends another Galactic Donuts to Zola to take her power. He gives a weak reasoning for why Zola decided to side with him. It kinda, it kinda sucks. It doesn't really make too much sense. She revealed that it was her who told them to swallow the spheres for Nene. And Jiro says it wasn't Nene, like this sounds anything at all like him. Look, swallow the spheres. Nene goes to eat Zola's sphere and Zola finds some self-worth. She calls out to Sabo to grab the collar and he puts it on Nene, sealing his power. Zola says that she was after Nene's power from the beginning. He becomes an old man again and Zola says that his sickness was because of the magic. He needed to develop a stronger soul to utilize it. She said Nene would never be able to because he's a bitch. However, she is not. Truly, she can control the magic. The party tries to stop her from following in Nene's footsteps and swallowing the light sphere. She reiterates that she's a good guy now and throws his light sphere. Nene's little feet steals it and he fucking eats it. He grows from the power and turns into the monster you saw painted in the ancient ruins in the beginning of the game. He is the bioweapon that wiped out all the ancients. You fight him in the final battle, in the end he falls into a pit of lava, maybe dying forever? The light sphere comes out of him and shatters. The party then goes to restore the world. All the calamities set forth by Nene end and everybody can live happily. Some time passes and Shu goes to find a flower. The world is still broken up into cubes. He's using the mecha to fly around. King Gibral learns to use magic and asks if magic would ever awaken in the people again. Spoiler, it does. Mara goes to ruin King Gibral and Zola's moment. You get a prompt that asks if he would give Kluke the rare flower. He gives it to her and Shu and Jiro put her in an awkward spot, asking her to choose between the two. She asks if they can wait until her next birthday and the game ends. And that wraps up the entire game. Disc 3 was pretty good, but I still think Disc 2 was the best overall. It did wrap things up, but the final dungeon was pretty annoying. I really did not like that lava dungeon. Granted, I didn't do any of the side content, such as like the shuffle dungeon, or the dragons to get the rare accessory, or uh, etc. I shouldn't really be expected to do side content anyway. Just look at me. I'm just a baby. Uh, I did not like the rug pull they tried to do with Zola. I think that was very poorly executed and it sucked. She was evil and portrayed you for all of like what, like three minutes? It was stupid. It felt like it was just there for the sake of having some sort of twist at the end and I did not like it. And this is where the payoff for the Ancients backstory could have been huge. Like there could have been like some sort of implication. I don't know, I'm not a video game writer, but there could have been something. It was just barely explored and it left the ending feeling kind of lackluster. Like Nene's little fetus grew huge and you killed him. Okay. Don't really care that much. And plus he wasn't even the main antagonist. Or was he? I don't know, he could have been, but we didn't get more ancient backstory, so I'm gonna say no. But with all that being said, it's very easy to speak critically of something, especially something that I hold so dear to me. But 16 years later, I still did enjoy Blue Dragon very much. It's still a very charming game, and it's one of the best Dragon Quest clones you're probably ever going to get. Most of my negativity comes from me wearing my rose-tinted glasses and having them just be, like, fucking stepped on, you know? Uh, most of my main gripes really just come from the writing. It was... it was bad. It was bad. A poorly written game. There were some really high stakes being set and it just did not feel serious the whole time. Most of the main party being children really didn't help either, especially when heavy topics like suicide came up. I keep harping about the backstory with the ancients because that was that just seems like such an easy kill. It seems like it just got cut at the last minute or something because there's so much setup that happens for them and then you just... I don't care. You didn't do anything that made me care about them. I'm sorry. Instead of doing any of that, they just had, hey, here's this one note boring ass villain. Let's go get him. And then he wasn't even the true final boss. It was this little fucking fetus thing. And... And they're like, oh yeah, we sprinkled some of the murals. Look at it. Isn't that good? No. It's not. The individual stories were okay to meh. I liked Patches Town and I liked Gibral. I didn't like Alamura Village. I didn't like a lot of the filler dungeons. Um, yeah. Now there are two sequels on the Nintendo DS. I have played both of them, but I have not finished either of them. And I really couldn't tell you much of what happens in either of them. And to be quite frank, at this moment in my life, I'm not really interested in playing them.
There's also a four volume manga, Raul Grad, which is loosely based off the game. Uh, I own all four physical versions, but I never got around to reading them really. I was a big fan of the anime though, it's on Hulu if you want to check it out. I think it's worth a watch. Now after finally sitting down from start to finish and beating Blue Dragon, is it one of my favorite games? Well, just purely out of nostalgia, yes, it's probably never going to change. Nostalgia is pretty strong, you know? And I still think it's my own personal Chrono Trigger, even though Chrono Trigger has aged incredibly well, and this not so much. But it's still the game that got me into J JRPGs. But it's still the game that got me into traditional role-playing games, and I thank it for that, because I have a lot of fun with these games. Is it my favorite game ever made? No. I don't even think it's better than his older brother, Lost Odyssey. And plus, Like a Dragon 7 is the greatest game of all time, like who, who is anyone kidding? It's only going to be dethroned by Like a Dragon 8 coming out soon. Excited for that. But I do think Blue Dragon holds up and it's worth a playthrough if you're interested in anything that I just talked about. I know I'm giving a lot of mixed signals, but I really do care for this game and I like it. And I think it's fun. I do like the combat, I do like the character design. I do like the OST, there's a lot to like here. It's just don't go in expecting a crazy good fucking life changing story, you know? You should play Lost Odyssey for that. Overall, Blue Dragon is a painful reminder that revisiting things from your childhood isn't always a great idea, and it's better to just let memories be memories sometimes. I am happy that I finally got through it, but I do wish that I did so at a younger age so I wasn't so critical about it. And I do wish I didn't make a video about it, because I had to be extra critical about it. Sakaguchi also revealed he's working on a new title as of me recording this video. Maybe it'll be Blue Dragon 2. Or 4. It would be Blue Dragon 4 if it is a Blue Dragon game, because there's two other games on the DS. Remember when I told you that? Do you? Good. And at some point I do want to play Fantasia, which is an Apple Arcade exclusive that Mist Walker made, and, and it's going to be Nobuo Uematsu's last full-length OST, so I really, really kind of want to check that out. I was going to wait for the Steam version of that, but I mean, look at this totally real leaked screenshot with Apple Arcade scratched out in paint in like two seconds. Yeah, it's probably not happening. Well, that wraps up everything I have to say. Bye.